Oh, hello everyone. Great little turnout here, still waiting on a few more, I'm sure. That's fine. Brilliant, thanks so much for coming, everyone. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Um, so make yourselves comfortable, grab a drink, grab a few snacks or something, and uh, we'll be ready to hear, hear, hear the best to talk in a second. We'll just give everybody a couple of minutes to come in and then we'll we'll get cracking. And just so you're all aware, this uh, this lecture is being recorded. Um, so if anybody has any objections to that, uh, do let us know through the chat. Um, or if you wouldn't like your question recorded for whatever reason at the end, if you do have one, of course, then uh, do let us know. But otherwise, feel free to keep your camera off and keep yourselves muted. That's absolutely fine. Um, and uh, we'll just, we'll take it from there a little bit later. We will have a quick five minute break between uh, the end of Sylvester's talk and uh, the questions. So don't worry about that. Ah yes, I just saw Dan's um, comment in the in the chat box on the right hand side. Uh, do feel free to ask any questions during the talk or in the five minute period uh, after the talk to you know articulate your questions or any observations that you have, and uh, we'll put them to to Sylvester afterwards. Pressure's on. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Arthur. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, we've had a fair few looking forward to this talk over the last few weeks. So brilliant. Thank you very much for coming. All right, I think we're good to start. So hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, Midlands Academic Lecture uh, for February run by the Midlands Network of Popular Culture, or MidsPop culture for sure. Uh, you can find us on uh, Twitter at Mids Pop Culture, uh, and you can find us on Instagram and Facebook as well. Um, and for those of you who are um, hoping to watch a little bit later, or if you have to leave halfway through, that's absolutely fine. The recording will be available online uh, on our website. That's www.midspopculture.wixsite with an X dot com slash website. It's very important to have the slash website in at the end there. Uh, and Dan will have posted the website in the chat there. So if anybody wants to review it afterwards, so if you've enjoyed it so much, you'd like to see the lecture all over again, then it will be on our website for members to view uh, afterwards. And that's where it'll be stored. But uh, for now, uh, my name is Rhys. Uh, I'm one of the events managers for uh, the Midlands Network of Popular Culture. And we're here today with Professor Sylvester Arnab. Thank you so much, Sylvester, for uh, agreeing to talk today. It's really great to have you. Pleasure. And uh, you are talking today about uh, game design, uh, but specifically when it comes to uh, education. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, about uh, what you're going to talk about today and perhaps how you got into your line of research in the first place? What made you interested in it to begin with? Well, um, what I'm going to talk about is very much around the research that I've been doing for the past 10 years, really, um, on game design and how we can reduce the barrier for those who are not familiar with gaming um, to encourage them to create their own games and use them in all sorts of different uh, sectors really. And um, at the moment, I'm focusing more on education and how to encourage teachers to be able to create their own games and implement it in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So how I got into this particular area of research um, where um, my work was Previously, was very much around graphics, around vi visuals, and 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 how we can actually use visual to encourage um, um, interactions, so on and so forth. And that has evolved into serious games, gamification, and uh, yeah. So I'm 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 just interested to see how those who are not familiar with 
technologies such as um, you know games and 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 whatnot to be able to be familiar with it and then use it uh, in their own uh, practice really. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. It, it's do you know the first thing that came to my mind as well uh, when I heard about your talk and when you sent us the uh, when when you sent us the excerpt of your talk was. Over the years, I think video games have had a bit of a bad reputation when it comes to education, when it comes to trying to, uh, you know, engage uh, kids in positive ways in the classroom. Um, perhaps, do you think it's because uh, some people just simply don't understand how video games work? Or do you think there's uh, some other reasons uh, why there's been such a bad reputation, especially uh, up to about uh, 2010, 2012, up to the, about that point, things started to change after that. But why, why do you think that's the case? There is like uh, so many different factors that will influence someone's behavior, especially in terms of being addicted to certain things and you know using social media, games, on and so forth. But I think we need to look at the context of use. In terms of the use of games in the right context, can actually be very beneficial. It will nurture positive behaviors as well as they can actually learn a lot of things through the. Uh, experience but as many things in our lives um, you know it has to be in moderation so i think there are a lot of misconceptions of games being negative in all sorts of different ways i think perhaps i i do i do i do believe that it's the uh, 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 um, misunderstanding of games itself perhaps some of them might not have the experience in enjoying digital games and video games and also different different games out there and and uh, perhaps uh you know there are not a lot of um publications which are uh you know friendly enough for the general public to understand uh the evidence of the use of games in you know serious contexts and how they can actually be very beneficial to the society. So I think there are so many different factors that would influence someone's view on whether games are negative or positive. So it's like, you know, I suppose, like you were saying about trying to broaden those, uh, you know, the, the access, broaden the access to this kind of information and uh, present it in an approachable way so that even, you know, somebody off the street, the ordinary person can understand why it could be beneficial uh, to us in some way. That's fantastic. Well, we're really looking forward to hearing your talk. Just before we uh, we hand over to you, um, if you would like to uh, follow uh, Sylvester on uh, Twitter, we do have a handle for him. It's at srnab75 on Twitter. Uh, and if you would like to post any questions via Twitter, please use the hashtag GChanges, GChanges, just like that. And uh, we'll pick up on those questions and we'll put them to him after our talk, after we've had the five minute break as well. Uh, please be aware, once again, this is being recorded. Uh, so we would kindly ask you to keep yourselves muted during the talk itself. And then in the five minute break, uh, we'll, I'll come back in and uh, and let you know when we'll be rejoining the uh, the call. So uh, over to you, Sylvester, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, so I will just share my screen. Uh, should I do this right? Perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to talk about the work that I've been doing in this particular area in terms of, as I mentioned before, in terms of trying to make it easier for anyone who, 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 who are not familiar with games to be able to see the benefits as well as to perhaps explore you know, different ways for them to actually uh, apply um, games and game design in what whatever they are doing in their own practices and in this case um, i'm going to focus more on teachers focusing more on education and how we can actually implement it in learning and uh, just to give you a bit of a context in terms of where i'm i'm based um, i'm based at the disruptive media learning lab um, at coventry university and the lab is actually exploring ways for um, engaging staff and students across the university uh, in the way, how can we recontextualize teaching and learning? How can we sort of create new ways for engaging learners in all sorts of different uh, educational activities at the university? And the work that we are doing has expanded beyond 
higher education into you know, different levels of education as well as uh, including professional uh, development. And it's quite interesting to see how the different research that we have done in this particular area has in, in influenced a lot of different practices out there. And my work is very much focusing on the playful and gameful methodologies and practices um, that we would wish others to be able to implement in their practices. And of course, in terms of trying to encourage people to innovate the way they teach and learn can be a bit challenging because everyone is, is, is on you know, different um, stages of innovation in terms of the way that you interact with new technologies or new methods or those who are, you know, uh, you know, they are, they are excited with every single thing that they are, they are new in education, they would they, they wish to try them and, and those who are not familiar with it and they would just refuse to engage. So it is interesting to see how we can design an empowering experience. Motivation is a tricky um, area in terms of how can we understand what would help someone or onboard someone into some activities that can be uh, beneficial to them in, in, you know, in the long term. So one of the, of the key things that we are focusing on is very much around remixing play. And what do I mean by this is how can we design experiences that can be inspired by play and gameplay? How can we replicate the emotional connection that we have with play? All of us, you know, uh, uh, have en engaged in, in, in different sorts, you know, all sorts of different forms of play um, growing up. And the engagement that we had in those experiences, how can we replicate that? And how can we encourage people to engage in the, uh, um, the serious outcomes of play? Um, because we can learn all sorts of different things. But, you know, when I was growing up, so I learned um, about numbers and, 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 and alphabets and spelling and reading through playing games. Um, how can we encourage the same sort of um, intrinsic motivation that we had when we were playing games and, and, and create an experience that would be able to encourage um, anyone to engage in um, serious practices or serious activities? And play itself, um, there are so many different types of play. Um, if you look at uh, research in, in, in play, but I'm not going uh, into that today, but if you look at the different types of play, it can actually link to different types of skills that we can actually gain um, from the different activities that we would do uh, within the play context. And if you look at what's happening now in terms of the pandemic, um, you know, there's so many reports out there um, that demonstrate how useful um, gaming and gameplay uh, in, in, in the development of young people in terms of the way that they engage with play uh, uh, in, in, in games and how they explore different types of skills as well as providing them the opportunity to socialize with those or playing similar games and allowing them to explore different environments um, since we can't actually go out anywhere um, in, uh, during lockdown. So games has given us this engagement that we need uh, in terms of social engagement, engage, engagement with something that is more active uh, and something that is more interesting in terms of the context, the narratives, the stories that we can actually go through. And I myself has been engaging with or oh, oh, I must say re-engaging with game playing this lockdown um, because work has been so busy, even though it's like my research was very much around games, but for, for, for the last probably three, four years, uh, work has been so busy and, and that took me away from enjoyment in terms of playing games. And lockdown has given me the opportunity to explore and, 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 and to really rejuvenate my love and my passion in, in game playing. And, and, and I think it is a wonderful thing. And the, the things that we can learn from it, the emotional connection and the, the emotional experiences that, that we can have through all these games can really, really inspire us in, in our work. And the fact that if you look at you know, games and gameplay, um, games is very much embedded in our everyday lives. Everyone has engaged in different types of games um, 
analog games, physical games, digital games, hybrid games, Pokemon Go um, was one of those games that has really, really opened up um, conversations and discourse around, you know, those who are not familiar with games or starting to engage with games because Pokemon has provided the opportunity for us to engage with our physical surroundings. Um, and that has really changed uh, um, the way we engage with games, uh, which, which, which I think is interesting. And the fact that there are so many game shops and game cafes uh, um, that we've seen in different cities in the UK uh, have shown that, you know, all those retro board games are coming back and people are, you know, and re-engaging with, with, with games and gameplay. And can we encourage, facilitate and, and, and track change through gameplay? Uh, games in itself, uh, you know, it, it's just a representation of play, not in its complete sense, um, but we can actually use games um, to measure or to track or to understand or to investigate the benefits of play um, because of the rules and uh, uh, the, the, the different structure, the feedback loop that we can include in games and uh, can help us to create this magic circle whether the magic circle will be restrictive or whether it is, it is, it is gonna be less restrictive that will allow free play within that particular context. So it's up to us as the designer to create the experience of play and how we can encourage um, someone to be able to engage with some serious context perhaps. And we have looked at this in so many different projects, as you can see on the screen, and uh, they are funded by so many different funders from the EU Commission to the UK funders as well as, as, well as internationally. And we try to understand play and games in so many different ways. And in, even in one of the projects that, that uh, we had previously, it's a project that's trying to implement playful learning in the farming sector, which is totally different. And, and it's so interesting to see how we can engage with those who are not normally be associated to play or games. And, and I find that um, highly interesting. And one of the projects I'm gonna talk about is Game Changers, hence the hashtag um, G Changers. Um, it is about encouraging co-creativity through playful and gameful practices. And um, this initi initiative has recently won an award for um, gamification for educational learning. And it, is, it, is, it, it was an industrial led um, Award, um, so we are we are quite proud to have been um, uh, given this particular uh, recognition. And game change is all about trying to see how can we encourage people to understand the different types of gaps and challenges that, that they wish to address, and how they can actually do it, and how they can actually test it and implement it, and how can they scale it up. Um, so it is a cross between, um, you know, game design and design thinking in trying to get people to think about uh, engaging with the community that they would wish to implement, you know, game based intervention with and how they can co create that. So game changes, you know, through the empirical ex experimental groundwork, we've come up with so many different frameworks and design uh, guidelines um, that has been implemented and adapted in Malaysia. Um, so we've worked in uh, Malaysia under the Creative Culture um, Project um, where we actually work with schools in very remote parts of Borneo and teachers are now creating their own games and implement it in the classroom. And the success of these two in initiatives has um, have, um, influence or inform the success of the other two projects which are currently live. Um, Creative Culture 4.0 is um, aiming to train about 400 teachers in Malaysia and ACES is expanding the impact in Southeast Asia. So we are implementing our approach in Vietnam and Indonesia as well. And, 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 and these are the different types of example of how we can actually cascade the change, the impact through the small initiatives that we've done in play and how useful it is in so many different contexts. 
And essentially, um, the main message is educators or teachers are the agents of change. Um, as you can see there, the quote from UNESCO is saying that the upskilling of school teachers is one of the most effective and direct means of achieving all of the United Nations um, sustainable development goals. And in this case, SDG4, which um, refers to um, equitable, inclusive quality education as key to developing um, um, our, uh, you know, the, the, the different community around the world and teachers uh, they do play a key role in this. And of course, when, when we talk about play and games and, and, and you know, how useful it is in education, the question will always be like, how, how can we go about doing this? How can we ensure that what we're doing sort of fits with the curriculum? And how can we ensure that teachers' um, uh, workload is not increased? For example, now in the pandemic, a workload uh, for teachers is sky high. And not only they have to home homeschool their own children, they will have to teach, they have to prepare all sorts of different digital online materials and stuff. And how can we think about experiences that we can create for our learners and ensuring that they are um, you know, beneficial and they are empowering as well. There is no fixed formula, unfortunately, in terms of play and games for learning. There are so many different examples out there that will provide evidence on the efficacy of using games in all sorts of different areas in teaching different types of subjects or in creating in interventions uh, in terms of youth development, uh, you know, and, and professional development, so on and so forth. And we can learn from that. And one thing that I've learned is there is a huge value in the process of game making where we can come together to create something meaningful. It's all about the sense of autonomy, the sense of agency, and the sense of uh, ownership in the process. When we create something, we will be invested in it. So I find it so important to encourage people to come together and co-create um, game and playful experiences um, for whatever uh, applications that they would wish to implement the playful methodologies in. So um, there are so many different types of um, methods and models that we have created through the research that we have done for so many years. As you can see here in terms of a more pragmatic and transdisciplinary process. Transdisciplinary refers to the uh, merging of, of all sorts of different perspectives from, from different disciplines, it's like from health research, from educational research, from game development, from um, all sorts of different perspectives that will allow us to create experiences that is going to be useful for the target audience that we are going to work with. And one of the example here um, is um, our, we, we experimented the approach with staff and students at the university. So two lecturers and two students and two researchers, they collaborated in thinking about the different gaps in the teaching and learning at the university. So the lecturers were focusing on uh, the teaching and learning of Italian language. So they used that as an example of a gap that they, that they can see in terms of practicing of the language itself. And starting with the context, they identify what are the different types of activities that will encourage someone to practice or perhaps reflect on their capabilities in that particular language. And that particular context influence the different types of gameful or playful design that we can create around this particular context. And through the design, it will inform what types of technology or non-technology that were uh, enable this experience to happen. So as you can see here, the experience of the um, co-creation is very much um, driven by the needs and driven by the gaps and driven by the challenges. And it is not driven by technology. Um, technology was the last discussions that we had in terms of how can we enable this wonderful 
gameful and playful experiences. So through, by looking at all sorts of different inspirations, so we were in, at that time, we were inspired by Pokemon Go in terms of active learning. Can we encourage people to go into different locations and then practice um, the language? Um, so by using a free software, which is called Tailblazer, uh, because we, had, uh, we have a good partnership with the MIT in the US. Um, so that allows the lecturers and the students to co-create the experiences and we can actually use it in Coventry city center and different locations will trigger different types of missions and quests based on the story which have been co-created by the lecturers and the students. And this is an interesting example of how those who are not familiar with games can be onboarded into the creation and development of games through the context and the gaps and the challenges that they would wish to address because it is important for us to take ownership of the process itself and it is also important for us to really think about um, our connection with the challenge um, and, and, and what we want to see happen and what we want to see change in that particular context but yeah of course looking at different methodologies different models different uh, frameworks, it can be a bit overwhelming. And I've only shown two of the different, uh, you know, uh, 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 piece of work that we have done in this particular area. Um, and it, it can be a bit confusing. So there is um, a benefit in seeing a program that we want to create for those who wants to get into uh, game creation who wants to get into uh, play creation uh, and, and how they can actually implement it, uh, implement it in their particular practice. Onboarding is important. How can we onboard them? What are the programs that we can run in order for them to be onboarded into the process for the, so that they can get used to it? They can practice it. They can implement and refine their methods. And towards the end, they can actually master the process, meaning that they don't actually need us to facilitate the process. They will be able to understand what are the different approaches that they can use, how they can actually use it, the confidence level um, of, of co-creating um, uh, playful and gameful uh, practices. Um, so I find it interesting to see how those who have engaged with us have been involved in this uh, piece of work. And, and I think it's very interesting. And as an example of onboarding, um, we have these uh, flashcards that we use to engage with um, um, those who are interested in game playing and the, the design of games, is to use two different cards. One is to represent a topic, a random topic, and the other one to represent a random game and to encourage people to spend perhaps a minute or even half a minute to quickly think of a game idea. For example, how can we create or take inspiration from Cluedo and create something that is going to address issues related to social responsibilities? So when we first run this, someone can actually create something in less than a minute. And that was amazing and there, uh, there was surprise in terms of, oh, I didn't know that I can create a game idea. And the caveat is it doesn't have to be perfect because you would need to practice it. You have an idea and then you would build on top of it and then you would further develop it. And by using this sort of approach, it will allow you to practice your creative uh, muscle in terms of you being confident in thinking about, okay, this is the topic, this is the game, let's create a new game out, out of this. And how can we understand the mechanics of that particular game? How can we understand the aesthetics of that particular game um, that will help us to understand, okay, how can we address the issues related to that particular topic? So we've run this in so many different ways where we have used it with so many stakeholders uh, from teachers to those who are uh, bosses of uh, companies and those who are actually very young in terms of trying to understand you know how can we 
um, co-create games in a fun way. And it is important, as I said before, it is iterative and incremental in terms of practice building, practice makes perfect, or perhaps we should say practice makes better because no one and nothing is perfect. Um, so this uh, you can you can you can look at the uh, um, the workshop um, example that we always run. Um, so it is an interesting approach where once you have an idea of what games or what what ideas that you would like to further develop, you can go through this process. It is an iterative incremental process for you to understand the different types of mechanics. How can you map it against uh, learning um, actions? How can you ensure that it is uh, linked to the curriculum if you want to run it within a classroom setting? So there are so many different ways of doing this and encouraging people to explore the process of creation. And it is interesting and so inspiring, inspiring to see those who manage to create their own games and it's so powerful. And these are some of the examples. Um, just to give you, you know, a few examples, there are so many different examples out there, but these are the different types of activities which have been created. For example, the teacher remix games, as you can see on the floor is like uh, um, hopscotch, which has been remixed into a game to teach science. And you can see card games, which have been used to encourage people um, to understand more about empathy. And you can see educational escape rooms where people creating escape rooms for teaching and learning, which is a more hybrid approach. And homeless monopoly, which has won uh, a, a joint award in 2019 on game in development. So this game was co-created with the homeless community, the homeless charity, as well as school uh, children, as well as teachers in trying to understand, you know, what are the different aspects that we can create that will raise awareness on homelessness in terms of the different spectrum of homelessness. And of course, location-based games and the different um, applications that can be created by, you know, staff and students as well across the different schools and across the different universities. And you can see the different types of games here which have been co-created by um, the different stakeholders using the approach that I've just mentioned previously. And this has been implemented in Malaysia, as I said before, it has been adapted in Malaysia and it has received a lot of press coverage. And you can see in the pictures, um, that is one of the uh, villages that we went to working with the um, teachers and the students and um, this particular village that you have to fly from the UK to Kuala Lumpur for Kuala Lumpur to another city which is called Kuching and from Kuching you have to fly to another town which is called Miri and from Miri you have to fly using a twin otter to a smaller uh, uh, airport and from there, you would have to actually take the boat for about one and a half hours. So it, it was, it is that remote. And you can see that teachers who are engaging with communities in remote areas can co-create their games. They were so surprised when they go through the process and they felt empowered that they can actually create creative resources that they can use in the classroom. And they are still implementing this approach. Um, so these are some of the games that they have created. There are more than 20 games which have, which have been created by the teachers, for teachers, and they share it as a community. And they have also um, partnered with us in the creation of this blueprint in terms of the guidelines to, to encourage other teachers to be able to create their own games and also play cards where they can use to encourage teachers uh, in their own schools to be able to, uh, uh, to understand the process of, of co-creation. Because these teachers, some of them have mastered the process so they can actually guide other teachers as well. And space is important. It's a shame that we can't actually be in a physical space when we work together, um, but space, virtual or physical are important. They will encourage people to be more Creative and the pictures that, that you see on the screen now, uh, this is the first gamification center for education in Malaysia, which was set up as a result of the partnership that we had with them in 
Malaysia, and the approach has also been, been embedded as part of the Masters for Learning Sciences for teachers who are going for uh, professional development. And it's such an exciting um, you know, process that we have gone through with them. And the fact that this is, this is an impact because they are running it themselves. And it's just great to see them engaging with teachers and um, lecturers in uh, the universities as well as schools. And in ACES, as I said before, we extended the impact or the approach that we have into Vietnam and Indonesia. Um, it is to see, can we develop resilience through play, which is, in, uh, which is specifically important, especially now in terms of the pandemic, how can we develop the competencies and skills that will encourage people to be more resilient in what they do? in how they engage with the community, how they engage with the situation, how they engage with the learning, so on and so forth. So this project is still alive. We are only a year into this particular project now and so many different fantastic stuff that are happening in the different, 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 different parts of the three countries. And Vietnam, the um, cases for COVID is not as bad as Malaysia, so they can run uh, physical, activities so we are very inspired with what they are doing there they, they, they took the approach created different types of activities and working with staff and students across the different schools uh, in Vietnam so playful or play-based learning or game-based learning is an evidence-based and universal way to build resilience it is important to encourage grassroots development that is more universal because play is universal. We all understand what play is and the emotional connection that we have with play, which I think is important. And uh, there are a lot of research we are, there are, we are conducting in this particular area, which will inform most of the uh, work that we are going to do in the future. And one of the key things that we are working on at the moment is also to explore how we can actually use playful and gameful methodology in other sectors other than education, in how can we change behavior and how can we nurture positive attitudes? And of course, in that perhaps related to the question which was asked in the beginning in terms of how can we address misinformation? How can we address the issues uh, in terms of misinformation on social media so on and so forth? So how can we use play and games to address this particular challenges we are facing in the post-digital uh, um, world that we are that that we are in. So yes, and looking back at this uh, in terms of cascading change and impact, and this is perhaps relevant for everything that we are doing in terms of taking inspiration from popular culture. Gaming is popular culture. There's so many different popular cultures out there. How can we learn from all these different methods, all these different practices, and how can we run different types of activities and try to learn more about the different aspects, the experiments that we can run, the groundwork that, that we can run, which can actually impact different communities beyond the community, uh, you know, um, whom we started with in terms of game change. We started with staff and students across the university in terms of introducing play and games into in terms of trying to encourage them to remember how um, they have engaged or how they are engaging with games, how they are engaging with play in a leisure sort of context and how that can be implemented in other practices. For example, teaching and learning in health, in, in all sorts of different uh, areas out there. And there are a lot of research as well that is looking at games and play in terms of mental health. So there are so many different aspects, but one thing about play and games that is so important is the fact that it's all about trying to encourage the sense of autonomy, trying to encourage the sense, the sense of agency, trying to onboard people into the process. So we can create these games. We as a community, as in teachers, nurses, or anyone in the general public who are interested in understanding how we can actually use and reuse existing games in a serious context, all of us should be able to think about how 
we can be creative with it, how we can engage with those who might be uh, who might benefit from um, such practices. Um, and I think we need to provide a space and an opportunity for people to engage with this type of approach in trying to understand gaming as a popular culture and how can we implement it in quote unquote serious context because playing is serious. It helps us to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to experience fun, to, to, to experience enjoyment. You know, when, when, when I mentioned fun, you need, to think, you need to think about the soft fun and the hard fun. The hard fun is when we are playing certain games, we want to master it, we want to compete, we want to make sure that we gain the skills to be able to level up in a particular game. So all sorts of different ways. And uh, I, can, I, can, uh, I, can, I can talk the whole day about games and playing how interesting it is for anyone to, to engage with in, in, in all sorts of different ways. And we don't have to be a gamer I think the word gamer is quite restrict restrictive. It is it, 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 it is not inclusive. It's like anyone who's interested in games should be able to express their views and how they would think games and play could influence what they do in their practices. And some of the work that we are doing is has been used in so many different ways. And this is an example in Europe. Uh, it, it has been included as part of the um, uh, EU school education gateway, as part of the resources in encouraging teachers to level up in the understanding of play and games in, in, in how they can actually co-create and implement their own games. Uh, because of course, we need to en ensure the onboarding of using games in your classroom through to co-creating games that you can use in your classroom. So instead of just using as an instrument is we can help teachers to be able to discover their passion for being the creator and co-creator of games that can use in the classroom. And with that, thank you very much. Um, most of the stuff that I talk about today is, uh, is, is part of the book, which was released last year, uh, which is called Game Science in Hybrid Learning Spaces. And it does give a lot more examples and a lot more um, different types of case studies and different types of um, uh, methodologies and uh, different types of views and perspectives that will be uh, relevant for different types of readers. Um, for those of you who are, from, uh, who are interested in the research of it, that is as a part where it talks a lot about the research part of it as well and also the practice, because I believe in the connection between research, development and practice that are important in terms for us to actually um, uh, grow in this particular area and be able to provide a lot more impact in so many different sectors. Thank you very much. And thank you for the, uh, it is a pleasure for me to share some of the work that I've been doing for the past few years. And yeah, so I'm ready for some questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Sylvester. That was, that was really an inspiring uh, talk. Um, and I think, for me, the main takeaways um, is that the gamification of education results in sort of the engagement of many different senses. And you can use that to teach a range of skills from, you know, practical skills to emotional skills, um, societal responsibilities, abstract thought even. And I think it's fascinating that the that uh, UNESCO, you know, said that the upskilling of school teachers is one of the most effective and direct means of achieving all of the um, of the SDG four goals. I think that I didn't even realize that that is absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, and I think that's a, a real selling point, to be honest, uh, to the kind of research that's going on right now into gamification. I see we've had many questions uh, already, both uh, on Zoom and uh, through our inbox. So what we're going to do is we're going to take just five minutes out. Um, if you have any more questions, please uh, articulate them. Feel free to put them in the uh, chat box here. Or if you want to uh, hashtag G, uh, G changes, that's G, I was about to say game changes, then that's the full title, but hashtag G changers uh, on Twitter. Uh, feel free to post your question there, but we'll return at, um, let's say, 3.50. So that's, that's a neat five minutes. Um, and uh, we'll look at some questions then. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. See you then. See you then.
Right. I think we're uh, just about ready to uh, take some questions, I think. Well, thank you once again, uh, Sylvester, for that uh, incredibly interesting talk. Um, we have some questions from our viewers, uh, but the first one I'll put to you is, um, I mean, when, when, you, when you discuss replicating the sort of experiences inspired by play and by gameplay, uh, I, I can't help but think of, um, of Lego, actually, in the classroom. I mean, it's, it's almost a staple example in my mind, uh, as it, you know, it teaches things like spatial awareness, um, color coordination, basic mathematics, and, and generally fosters creative thought. The first question here being, how do we approach uh, replicating these effects on a larger scale? Uh, maybe it links into the transdisciplinary process that you mentioned earlier when we gather many different views. H how, would you, how would you approach replicating it on a large scale? Oh, I think you're uh, muted there, uh, Svasta. Yeah. Uh, it all depends on the target groups that that you are working with in terms of because it is it is quite difficult in terms to scale certain activities up but using your lego examples um as as you know lego is 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 one of my favorites as well we use that all the time in terms of trying to encourage people to be creating creating something and the the co the co creation in terms of the target audience it is it is important one 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 of the most important thing is to understand the context of why you you want to actually uh, run certain activities perhaps in terms of what are the gaps and challenges that you, that you wish to address what is the actual objectives whether it's learning objectives or whether it is behavioral sort of um, objectives on and so forth and that would help you to identify the different types of elements of change that you wish to happen so meaning that you would roughly know, for example, there are three key learning objectives that I would wish to address, and this is how I would know that these objectives will be met, right? Or certain skills will be met, or certain behavior will be changed. Once you have that nailed down in terms of trying to understand the starting point, that would help you to understand different types of activities that you would wish to create. So different types of activities that you wish to create, then you would think about who the stakeholders are, if what what age range, uh, in terms of perhaps the uh, cultural background, or uh, perhaps um, to, to try and understand what types of activities that may influence them uh, in terms of their behavior, or what activities that that will engage them better, because it is a trial and error sort of approach. Because you can't actually, most of the time, the games that we have we have, we have used it might not be as engaging as we want it to be in terms of the complete population that we wish to engage with. But these are the things that you can learn from and from the feedback that you actually get from the users as well as the learners, the teachers themselves. And this is the iterative process I mentioned before where you would understand, oh, some parts of this didn't actually work and it didn't actually help me to implement a particular change that I wish to happen. How can we implement it together? And some of the students would be involved in the core in the core creation, say that oh, we think this, this should be done this way, and it, you can test it the second round. So I think there'll be a lot of testing, a lot of iteration. Do not expect it to be perfect first time, um, because it would not be perfect first time. You it might be, um, but yeah. So I think it's the iterative and incre incremental process of including the target audience as part of the design and implementation process, I think is a way to scale up. I think you've hit on a very important point there, which is the autonomy that people have in the creation. And funnily enough, last year during our uh, forum, uh, the Midlands Network of Popular Culture Forum that we had during the summer last year, we had the research panel of digital environments uh, in 21st century visual media. We had Lauren Ash, who was a game designer at Crystal Dynamics. We had Vincenzo Barcasi, uh, who was uh, with uh, Sledgehammer Games. And we had Claudia Kovalchuk, uh, who was um, with Side Effects Canada. And they all said the same thing is that the context influences the game design. 
the yeah. technology doesn't influence the game design. We start off with, like you said, filling those holes, starting off by what does the audience need? What is the objective? And then building the idea around that. So I think you really hit the nail on the head there uh, when you were talking about the autonomy and the creation. Um, but you also mentioned some of the challenges. And the other question I have to you is um, with overcoming this gamer stereotype uh, that has been uh, created over the years, has been formed from, um, you know, platforms such as Twitch or uh, YouTube or things like that. And of course, you're not just talking about video games. You're also talking about board games. You're talking about practical games as well. But how, how do you think we should go about dispelling some of the uh, negative stereotypes around this gamer tag? I think uh, what, one thing for sure is to get rid of, of the stereotype in terms of when someone mentioned that they are a gamer without seeing them, the society might think, oh, these are the people who are, who, who will spend hours in the bedroom playing video games. And, uh, you know, that sort of image that has been portrayed in so many years uh, in terms of what a gamer is. I think one of the key things that we, we, we need to, uh, that we can actually do, which we have done actually in the past, uh, we went to different schools and run play day. Remember when we used to be in schools, it was a long time for me when we used to have play day, but it, 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 there was sports there, but this is more about games, introducing them to different types of games. Sure. Uh, from analog games to digital games to hybrid games, getting them to, to understand what they are and they can ask questions about it. So that is one way. And secondly is, I think is to really make it more mainstream in terms of uh, the, 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 the approach that we can have with the press, working with the press. And there are a lot of researchers out there trying to publish something on different types of blogs um, that would reach different communities, introducing all sorts of different, uh, you know, research driven uh, materials, but in a more approachable way. So I think, I think my main point is all about engaging directly with the target audience and the community to dispel this, um, you know, this, this, this myth about if you are not a gamer, you are not as cool as me type thing. Or if, if, if you're not a, a gamer, you're not a geek type thing. So I think so there are a lot of misconception. So I've seen so many uh, people who are playing games and that they, they, they don't fit the stereotype, which is fantastic. Love it. Uh, so it's, um, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's just like uh, you used the example of uh, Malaysia earlier and Kuala Lumpur, you know, it's about the outreach at the end of the day, uh, the, you know, media combined with things like blogs, things like on a smaller scale, yeah. it really shapes our perceptions. Yeah. Uh, of these things. And myself, I've, I, I've taught abroad in Southeast Asia. I taught in Japan, amongst other places. And the first thing they, they do teach you is that, you know, uh, when you're um, pitching lessons to developing adults or, you know, children who are coming into the development stages, it's to gamify as much as possible because that is how they will remember things. It will engage them in a lot of different ways. Their senses will be... Um, uh, you know, will be activated by these uh, different modes uh, that you're teaching them and the, the different modes that you're actually conveying the information, which actually kind of leads me into uh, the, the one of the question we had here by, by Tim. Um, this question is, uh, what is the uh, comparison or contrast between gaming and gamification? Because there, there can be some confusion between that. And I think part of making it more accessible in, in terms of outreach is making this distinction. So um, over to you, how would you think about this? Uh, is that I dedicated sort of like a, a debate on that in my book in terms of the different jargons, the different names. Um, a few years back, someone wanted to start the word funification. I said, no, no more, no more. <laughs> so many different terms out there. But yeah, essentially there, there are so many uh, there are differences between the, you know, the, the when, when we talk about games, serious games, game-based learning, gamification, right? When we talk about gaming, games, as you know, what, what games are, games are environments in whatever forms or shapes, whether it's digital or non-digital, that would have rules and uh, uh, different design aspects, feedback loop that will allow someone to engage with the action, with the dynamics, as well as engage with other players if it is 
multiplayer and and whatnot. But gamification, essentially, gamification is about exploiting game design elements in a non-game context, mm -hmm. meaning that say that we are doing this Zoom, it is not a game, right? It, it is it, it, obviously it's not a game, um, and uh, perhaps you want to gamify it, and you'll be saying that the person who would give the uh, who would who would who would ask the most questions would get a voucher. Right. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> so you got that 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 sort of um, uh, that loop in terms of the actions of whoever in the system and the reward that they will get. That is, of course, one of the worst example of gamification because it is actually based on rewards. Oh. I give you something, and then uh, you do something. I will give you something. Type thing. Um, so. In terms of research in gamification, we are trying to go away from the points, uh, badge and leaderboards, PBL, even though they are not bad. If points, badges, and leaderboards come with meaning, then it will be something that is more beneficial. They said that we use the same example. You would say that some uh, the, the person who is actually asking the most questions and being able to answer the questions from the other you know uh, uh, people who post questions as well they will be able to guide the discussions in this particular topic rather than giving them rewards so meaning that you are giving them an empowerment in them not only asking questions but they are also thinking about answering questions that they would learn from other people as well, and they would be able to guide a discussion. So that is a different types of development. And gamification at the moment in different parts of the world, it is being used uh, in a way it overlaps with their understanding of game-based learning and their understanding of um, uh, serious games. So they use the word gamification for anything that would resemble a game that is used in a serious context, so on and so forth, which I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't try to correct them because that is wrong. That is not the way I would. The way, as you, as you have seen today, it's all about breaking the barriers, using so many different terms, and in the way, forcing people to fit themselves in the different categories is not healthy, I find. As you can see, there are so many different gamification platform that is including both games and gamified elements. For example, um, there was a platform which was created to encourage kids to check their blood sugar level. So on one hand, there was an app that is more about them trying to understand the progress, um, trying to understand why do they need to take a, a, and check the blood sugar level and uh, learn from that particular app on uh, what what do they mean type thing. But they are also using a game, meaning that each time they do that um, uh, finger prick, they will be able, to, the, the data that they collect will inform that particular game, the progress of that particular game or the elements in that particular game. And the same example is used in citizen science for cancer research. They gamify the process of looking through DNA data, which is so strenuous. So they encourage citizens to go in and do pattern matching. So they match different patterns. They, they didn't even know that they are doing research and helping researchers, but they, 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 they could see the progress and they could see the work competing with the other players and so they were like doing that without knowing that they are actually contributing towards science it's almost tricking them into a meaningful contribution isn't it it's exactly, exactly. so towards the end I said, oh my oh my god i've done i'm doing something for cancer research that, and i'm having fun Wow. So, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's incredible. Do you know what? It kind of reminds me of a phrase. I mean, you mentioned earlier, you know, practice makes better, of course, but it also reminds me of another phrase, you know, knowledge is its own reward because you mentioned moving away from, oh, you know, have a, have a treat, have a, have a reward every time you do something. Whereas here, 
it's the contribution or it's the lessons you learn in response to performing this particular game or this task that is its own reward and it it really is fascinating how um this this kind of culture is is created around it and speaking of feedback we have a question by amy uh, it kind of ties into it actually uh, i have found from my research into museum games and how museums can make games that there's often a tension between integrating the learning outcomes and ensuring that the game is still fun to play. So you're trying to you know, balance the two out, uh, which results in either boring or less game or, and more lesson, right? So what are your thoughts on overcoming this, this delicate balance between uh, something that is educational without being too boring, yeah. but also trying to gamify it? Yeah, uh, this is an interesting question and a question that is going to be timely, you know, uh, like in, in so many different ways in terms of the game research and game development for education. Um, I would refer you back to one of the slides that I had in terms of saying that there is no formula. But one of the key things that we are working on is to trying to understand at the uh, on the granular level of what makes games engaging or what makes games uh, useful for learning. Because most of the empirical evidence that we, 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 we can get from different research papers in terms of the evidence of how good games are in terms of encouraging learning, they, they do not actually talk about which part of the game that actually influence the learning. And there's, there are not a lot of literature out there that is, that is trying to look at that, but there are a few of the good ones. And we are actually working in a particular area as well, where we develop a model which we call learning mechanics game mechanics mapping. So that is our starting point to try to understand the connection between learning and gaming. What are the aspects of gaming that will perhaps influence the action of learning or encourage different types of learning? Because for example, like what we mentioned before in terms of having the uh, meaningful feedback mixed with the interaction in terms of uh, matching the patterns of DNA and also the competition. So the three elements, it will encourage people to understand about certain issues, get them to understand about the contribution to science perhaps. So you try and link it with what types of learning that is going to happen. It's not going to be perfect, but once you've done it a few times, you test it and test it and test it, you will see there are aspects of learning, uh, aspects of games, which can be engaging, that will influence certain learning to happen. And on top of that particular work, there is another layer of it. We are trying to connect the learning, the gaming, and motivation. So for Motivation, we are looking at self-determination theory, try to understand from the perspective of autonomy, the perspective of relatedness. So related, relatedness linked to social interaction, community relationships, which were encourage us to engage in something. And the last one is competency. This link to hard fun in hard fun we are having fun by being so frustrated with that particular game that you want to learn the skill in order to, I don't know, destroy that monster in that particular scenario, perhaps. Um, so the understanding of what fun is, what engage, engage, engagement is, engagement linked to, someone mentioned here in terms of cognitive, in terms of behavior, in terms of the interaction, social engagement. So. Um, that is like a, a bit of a long run about where to answer the question. And my thoughts of how we can overcome this is to really articulate in the beginning in terms of the connection between the different types of elements of the aspects of games that we think that we can assume, we can hypothesize that will be engaging based on existing games. That's why I advocate the remixing of aspects from existing games that we know is engaging uh, proven and tested and whatnot. And then we can try and see what could we balance this because that is always an issue. Balancing learning and gaming uh, are, are, are two important things. 
that we need to look into and it links to my previous comment on iteration you would learn by the alpha test the beta test and a few more tests with different stakeholders including them in the process to understand the engagement factor before we release it to the public and sometimes games are rushed probably perhaps due to a funded project due to finance for the city council or finance from the museums in, in order to release uh, games quickly to the users. But I think uh, there needs to be a longer period of testing and making sure that the balance are there. It might not be right, as I say, that practice makes better. It would be better and good enough to engage and good enough for that particular learning to actually happen. But it is a difficult challenge it is it is still a challenge in so many serious games game based learning and playful learning practices i think you you hit on a, another a very important note there where it's the hybridity of uh, bringing together all these different perspectives um that really uh, is the key to answering this this getting this balance right but when we have this kind of hybridity um the danger is then we're starting to bring in lots of different terminologies from different areas that perhaps you know don't necessarily gel together very well they contrast there yeah, and there's a lot of things to kind of iron out so i think arthur's question links into this when designing games in paper he says i struggle with the terminologies which to me sound similar for example motivation engagement and flow we, we hear these a lot i think we've heard some of these during your your talk as well sylvester also engagement can be divided into cognitive behavioral and emotional engagement so when designing games do we have to factor these specific definitions and differentiate them to help us guide the game design i think we you've answered this a little bit already but uh please yeah. but in in an ideal world um with a huge budget we would, would love to have so many different expertise <laughs> in terms of uh, especially when, when we talk about creating games for serious purposes it is important to ensure that we nurture the right attitudes, the right uh, quote unquote, right attitude and right behavior and the learning outcomes because we don't want to nurture negative. And uh, you know, there are a lot of risks in creating games can be very risky when you create something that it will nurture certain behaviors that might be addictive behaviors that might be uh, different from what you expect to uh, achieve. So my answer is in an ideal world, it's good to have the different experts in your team. And in, in a not so ideal world, uh, having, having transdisciplinary perspectives based on existing practices, which have been implemented in the different uh, uh, games is useful to understand how they did it. What are the different aspects that they implement and include in that particular game? And from there, you can actually try and see are there any connection with those dimensions into the game that I'm creating? And in terms of the terminology, it is good, it is, it is, it is, it is useful to factor all this in the design, as I said before, in terms of the connection between the learning, the gaming and motivation. And I know there are, there are a lot of um, uh, confusion in terms of the difference between motivation and engagement and, and flow. They, they all have similar roots, but engagement, I would say, is the outcome of when you are motivated to engage with something. So the engagement that, that, that we were, how do we want to immerse or how do we want to engage someone, whether contextually you engage them through the context of the activities, because people might find it purposeful, so they engage with it because uh, uh, they find that they are motivated by the sense of agency in that particular activity, or they might be more uh, engaged in terms of the emotional engagement because the story or the narrative which has been used in that particular game is so, it, it, it draws you in and you connect with it. And it's related to self-determination theory in terms of relatedness in terms of the meaning and the purpose of that particular story that really grab you and you want to follow it through. So there are so many different ways of doing it. 
And, and you know, this demonstrates how complex it is to create games for learning. But if we can actually include some of the existing aspects which are reported to be working in terms of the different types of aspects of motivation and, and engagement and flow is another one in terms of how engaged or how immersed are you in that particular activity or it, it, it all depends on the balance between the challenge and your you know ability and whatnot. so there's so many different things to think about of course and uh, you, you can break it down um, it, um, I think uh, I will need longer time to talk about this because it's quite an interesting topic but I'm not going to do it now but essentially if you think about creating your playful activities or gameful activities think about the levels the levels will be determined by the actual competencies of your players as well as what level of motivation are they are they really motivated to engage what are they interested in um, this link to different types of new pedagogy that is happening in the world so there's another topic that needs to be included as part of that pedagogy if you read the new report for innovating pedagogy 2021 the s1 which is called hip-hop based learning ah. using rap and using hip-hop music to encourage those who are in the urban in the mar in the marginalized urban areas to engage with learning so you can see it's all about trying to understand the users it's it's hard it's hard it's um you yeah. You 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 would never get it perfect, but you can achieve the better thing. Well, yeah, definitely. It kind of it well it ties into what you said earlier about the outreach, right? It's about connecting it at a grassroots level to create this impact where the inspiration starts exactly in the classrooms where um, where the information is being deployed in the first place. And so, if the information is being received to begin with in in a way that is easily remembered is enjoyable is its own reward then we can maybe you know demystify some of these uh these phrases or some of these um bing words you know associated from lots of different disciplines um i think we've got time for just uh, one more question here and um let's have a look i think everybody's had uh, tend to ask one question, uh, but we do have one here. I mean, I think you've already answered this um, in uh, by saying, you know, there isn't really one specific strategy that we're able to take. Uh, but Tim did ask, uh, can your uh, game, I, I assume by that he means the, the strategy that you employ, can it stretch to handle the different player types uh, that's included in Barton's yeah. taxonomy, for example, explorers, socializers? I think you've already answered this uh, in some in some way. Yeah. Um, it, well, it is, it is interesting. There are so many different uh, other player types um, which have been developed by others based on Bartos, for example, the one that Andre Marcheski has done in terms of what uh, um, some, some, some of the others have actually looked at. Um, and what I'm most interested in is in the current research on player traits. So it's all about the traits and characteristics. It's, it's not about their types because you can merge the different types, for example, the butter in terms of the killers, in terms of the achievers, in terms of socializers, explorers. You are part, part of the different elements of that. And it depends on the actual game itself because I always thought myself that I'm more of an explorer. I always thought that I'm, I'm that, 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 that part. But when I've always thought that, yeah. But, but, but when I play open world games, I get frustrated because I get distracted from the main storyline and then I lost interest because there's so many other things to do that is not relevant. And then you don't feel really invested in it compared to playing something that is partially open world, but it really, really um, sort of like force you onto the main storyline. And there are a lot of killing involved, of course. So, it's, it's, <laughs> um, but yeah. So there are, uh, in terms of uh, whether 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 our our games will stretch this, yes, um, in different ways. What we normally do is 
we try to look at the player characteristics and learner characteristics in terms of the way that learners will engage with learning, whether they are very much into active learning or they are very much into uh, reading because there are some learners who are so frustrated this year because they can't take exams because exams is one of the things that they find interesting. For example, this goes back to game design in terms of if we link someone who is very much interested in validation in terms of doing the exam as, 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 as ways for them to, to, to get recognized for what they can actually do. You can include all sorts of different, for example, explorer sort of approach, meaning that they would have, in order for them to reach that particular stage where they will be tested on something, they will have to diverge to something that would get them to learn skills in a partial way, then they will go on to another activity, another part of the, the skills that, that, that they will learn or the, the knowledge. And from there, they could actually have a more formative approach rather than a summative at the end. So they would know where they are in terms of their experience in that player learner journey, which I find interesting. And there are so many different ways for, uh, you know, if, if we do want to use Bartos taxonomy, we need to understand that that is the connection between all four different um, uh, types. I think once it extended to five, so you, you, you need to really see the connection between within all and each one of them, each different types might link to the types of learners that we have, or it might also link to the types of activities that we want to push our learners to do. For example, someone who is very much uh, theoretical, talking about theories and uh, knowing the theories, but not very practical, can we encourage them to do active learning in a different ways, but onboard them in such a way that we would follow the, uh, the uh, flow engagement folks theory in terms of the ability and the competence, the, the ability as well as a challenge, the difficulty level, the leveling up. So those are the things that we can actually include. But uh, at the moment, it doesn't um, stretch directly into the design that we're doing, but it is part of the needs analysis where we try to understand uh, whether someone has played games before or whether someone is interested in games and what types of learner they are. I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, something like Bartle's taxonomy is one specific perspective of how to approach game psychology or, or game development. And it's one of the aspects to be incorporated into this transdisciplinary process that Sylvester mentioned earlier. It's one specific uh, consideration that uh, we can you know, include and, and is very useful when it comes to thinking of these different theoretical examples. And then in practice, what can we practically take from that and merge uh, in, in a sort of pool with all of the other strengths uh, and, thing, and considerations? Um, I think we'll move on to our very last question uh, of the day, uh, which once again is from Amy. Uh, and you talked a lot about analog games, yes. but I'd be interested to hear if you've done any work with digital games. And you did speak a little bit about this being a, a post-digital era that we're in at the moment, um, especially as there are often more barriers to people becoming game makers, such as requiring coding knowledge. Yes. One of the key things that I mentioned today is about the onboarding stage. So you've got the onboarding where you would try and, uh, you, you would move into practice building and then you master the whole process. So even this pathway is iterative. So that sort of link with the question on how do we onboard those who are not familiar with games. So first and foremost, we will always use analog games first, especially those who are not familiar with games. So try to get them to understand even something as simple as hide and seek. Hide and seek is a digit, it's a strategy game, right? You strategize when you want to hide somewhere. You strategize when you want to start and search for, uh, you know, those who are in hiding type thing. Anyway, um, so we normally use something as simple as that to really break the barrier, get people to laugh about it, and then play around with it, and then slowly move to examples which are very much digital. Um, the card games, uh, the the flashcards that we showed before, um, we have about thirty-two different example games from. 
uh, analog to digital games to mobile games to um, hybrid games as examples for people to play around with. I and thought that was an excellent, an excellent way to do it. By the way, that's a really, really great way. Quick, it's like a quick, a quick thing that you 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 practice with yourself. And some of the teachers now actually say that each time that we see a problem, we think of a game that can solve that. I said that it's your fault. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, like, I like that. But anyway, so in answering the um, question, it's um, yes, uh, we do digital games as well. Um, so the barriers in terms of once have past the first barrier in terms of they master the process of creating something analog, they would be able to be more open exploring new ways of creating stuff because technology is at the end of the requirements. It's not driven by technology. But one of the examples that I've shown you um, is um, the game to teach language um, uh, in Coventry. So that is a digital game. So you use a mobile phone, you go to the CA center, it just trigger you something. So the quests and the missions appear. So you have to do something or you have to speak to it type thing. So that is a hybrid approach. And we are also uh, listing down uh, free softwares that uh, 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 the stakeholders will use. One of the example is the RPG maker. So librarians were creating them, creating games for uh, induction in the library. They are not gamers, but they managed to create that game and, it, and it's being used at the university now. Um, so that it's quite an interesting one. And there are so many other uh, um, example, for example, Construct, uh, Tailblazer is one example and um, free and cheap authoring tools that teachers can try to onboard themselves into understanding how to create something that is more digital. And once you've gone through that, and the next stage is perhaps you want to introduce Scratch, uh, one of the activities, but we didn't do it with teachers, we did it with the kids in the school um, to encourage them to engage with Scratch programming in terms of trying to understand how to create games in a simple way type thing. And of course, um, some, 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 some of them who are doing uh, different programs at the different universities that we have worked with, some of the teachers are looking at platforms, for example, Unity, um, and, and, and it's, they find it interesting that they can actually create an environment quickly. So that's what we inspired them, of course, to create all the mechanics you need, all sorts of different tutorials and scripting. But, but yeah, uh, we do digital games as well. At the moment, the teachers whom we, are, we have worked with have not created something using Unity, but they've created something using free softwares. I, I, I can really see how those would be useful, especially, I mean, having used myself RPG Maker and Trailblazer, you know, those ones especially they are great resources and they're open for anyone to use um they're approachable and um they they can really help with introducing you to this kind of new world of of gamifying education um and uh, you know hopefully some of you will will go on and and maybe apply some of what we've heard today uh in your in your own lessons or, or in your own uh, lines of work so I just want to say once again, thank you very much, uh, Sylvester, for your talk today. It really was very insightful and interesting. Um, if you have any more questions for Sylvester uh, or you'd, you'd like to follow him on social media, uh, his Twitter handle is at srnab75. Um, and that was the Game Changers um, initiative from Coventry University as well. So feel free to check their website out, uh, as well as uh, Sylvester's book on Game Science in Hybrid Learning Spaces, which is available on Rootledge. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, this recording uh, will be up uh, in the next week or so on www.midspopculture.wixsite forward slash website, uh, where you'll be able to see uh, this discussion all over again, including uh, any and all the questions that were put to Sylvester. Um, so I'll be in contact with you very soon, Sylvester. But in the meantime, thank you very much once again. Very much for having me. Thank you for the questions as well. Um, very useful. Really was. It really was for us as well. Take care now, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye. now. <laughs>